Hello and welcome. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Developmental Editor and Webinar Program Manager at John Wiley & Sons Publishers. And I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled, Extracellular Vesicle Detection, Problems, Pitfalls, and Solutions. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Beckman Coulter and Current Protocols, a publication of Wiley Publishers. Beckman Coulter is dedicated to advancing and optimizing the laboratory. The company's global leadership and world-class service and support deliver sophisticated instrument systems, reagents, and services to life science researchers in academic and commercial laboratories, enabling new discoveries in biology-based research and development. Current Protocols is in its 30th year and is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research protocols available for life scientists worldwide. With 18 titles and over 18,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days, and we will send you an email with details on how to access the on-demand webinar. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Facilis Toxavitis is the Resource Director and Associate Program Manager at the Flow Cytometry Science Center in the Center for Extracellular Vesicle Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He transitioned to academic research in the pathology department at Roger Williams Hospital, a Brown University teaching hospital, after receiving a degree in podiatric medicine from the University of Wales. John Tiggs is the technical director and manager of the Flow Cytometry Science Center in the Center for Extracellular Vesicle Research, also at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He received certification as an immunology specialist from the American Society of Clinical Pathologists after obtaining a degree in the biological sciences from Rhode Island College. So let's go ahead and get started with a very warm welcome to you, Vasilis. Good morning, uh, afternoon, and evening to everybody that is joining us today about this talk. I'm going to discuss uh, extracellular vesicle detection problem, pitfalls, and solutions. Um, we are going to start the presentation by giving a brief overview of what we are looking and, and why. First of all, we, go, we are going to discuss EVs, EVs or extracellular vesicles, um, the release from both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, the range in size between 40 and 1,000 nanometers, they encompass exosomes, ectosomes, microvesicles, and apoptotic bodies. And they also have a membrane that consists of a lipid bilayer similar to that of a cell plasma membrane with increased fraction of uh, cholesterol. They also contain phosphatidylserin in the outer layer, uh, the outer leaflet, which uh, may facilitate their internalization by recipient cells, which is uh, very important, something that we look uh, at currently. And reads in uh, spinal myelin, uh, gangliosides, and desaturated lipids, along with cholesterol, contribute to the rigidity of the EVs. Why EVs? Why we look at them? Well, they are contained, they're contained uh, cell-free plasma, and which is a place to look for functional biomarkers. It is more than protein, lipid, and metabolite-based meditators. And EVs and the EV-free compartment contain RNA species capable of transferring information between the cells. Can we use flow cytometry? And uh, one of the more common questions we get when we people come up to us to discuss uh, extracellular vesicles is if we, can, if we can use the current flow cytometers and flow cytometry to look at them. And if not, what do we have to do in order to see them? Well, one of the things that we uh, were faced on, when, especially when we first started doing this type of research, was looking at those um, uh, extracellular vesicles in a traditional flow cytometer. A traditional flow cytometer um, measurement, we set a threshold which has, it's set by the manufacturer, which eliminates anything smaller than one micrometer. Uh, all, all extracellular vesicles uh, are considered usually cellular debris, and small particle detection becomes secondary. 
The flow cytometers were uh, designed to look at whole blood. And here we see a picture of uh, a, a traditional uh, four-site scatter looking at whole blood, and we can see our uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, granulocytes. And then at the lower left-hand side, we have the red blood cells debris and dead cells. The thing is, because of the threshold that is set over there, um, we, the extracellular vesicles are included in those lower left-hand side corner, uh, along with the debris and everything else. One of the issues also we, uh, we face on the conventional analysis of AVs uh, because of their size is that the AVs were regarded to be a simple cellular debris fragments of part of apoptotic bodies. Instrumentation was designed for uh, whole blood, so it's looking for less than one micron. And the smaller considered size, um, the four standard was uh, standardized for less than one micron. Uh, size scatter did add some dynamic range, but was limited, and the manufacturer threshold was said to, to exclude one micron in size. So even if we did adjustments on our flow cytometers, we could only see um, about uh, greater or equal to 500 nanometers. Um, excuse me for a little bit of lag, but I had a problem with uh, transitioning through my slides. Uh, there was seemed to be my connection giving me a little bit of uh, delay here. So we'll continue on and discuss um, uh, a little more about the flow cytometric analysis of uh, extracellular vesicles. Here we see a picture of uh, extracellular vesicles attempted to be um, read with a conventional uh, flow cytometer with no changes uh, using a four scatter photodiode. And again, we see the limitation uh, on the size, um, and we can see about 500 nanometers. Um, these, are, I believe, are some uh, uh, polystyrene beads that we were using at the time in order to set um, and range in the current uh, on that uh, flow, flow cytometer. So the traditional four scatter detection of particles we have a laser line hit the, the particle, and we have the scatter of, of the light. And the light is scattered at about 10 degrees, and as the cell passes through the laser beam, and then on the other end with a photodiode, we capture that, um, we capture that light um, and try to determine the size of the particle. Now, there's one major problem here. The problem is that the microvesicles that we're looking, or the extracellular vesicles, rather, are very small structures. Uh, conventional flow cytometers are designed to look anything between 500 and above, um, or even better, one micron and above, whereas the, those little particles of interest, um, they fall outside the range. Um, so how do we address this? Well, we got together um, with some colleagues, and uh, we did a little bit of work in some new instrumentation, and the work was... Uh, uh, actually published uh, a comprehensive metho methodology for the acquisition analysis and sorting of extracellular vesicles, um, term as nanos and as nanofacts. We work with uh, Dr. Jennifer Jones down the, uh, at the NIH. And we came with a new flight flow cytometric analysis, a new paradigm of looking at particles in our flow cytometers. So with our new paradigm, and um, I apologize again, I'm having a little uh, trouble with transitioning the slides with my connection. So with, uh, we'll continue on. With a new paradigm is the current understanding for microparticles and exosomes is that they're actually functional uh, structures. And as a consequence, we need better tools in order to study them. Instrumentation um, modifications need to be made, so we have to enhance our resolution. Software modifications also needs to be made, uh, changes in the threshold function. So we have to have a greater control um, adjusting our threshold in order to see on the lower end of the instrument and be able to discriminate uh, uh, the extracellular vesicles uh, from noise and not uh, cut them off and disregard them as uh, debris. Also, a specific range of controls available is commercially um, a specific range of controls is commercially available for the instruments to optimize it and standardize it. That includes uh, beads from size 80 all the way up to 500 nanometers. Um, also, uh, fluorescence beads, um, MESF. And by using all these controls, we can do a daily QC 
and uh, see how the instrument perform, how our instrument is performing, in order to have a baseline and uh, try to determine the rates of those EVs that we're studying. So the flow cytometric analysis of EVs and the hardware enhancements that we have. So the instruments that we are using um, are designed to have an enhanced low end resolution. Uh, we have replaced at this time our photodiodes with four scatter PMTs and APDs or avalanche photodiodes. We have a high sensitivity PMTs and APDs on the side scatter, um, which also helps uh, quite a lot. Uh, the threshold that we use can be set minimally. Um, actually, in some instruments, we can go as low as 0 0.001. And the enhanced scatter angle that we have and the laser power at the intercept and high-end dichroic meters and bandpass filters also help us to get a better signal uh, to noise resolution. Low noise detection uh, with high quantum efficiency and minimum light loss ensuring high signal-to-noise ratio. Low end and dynamic range lends the ability to exclude noise without losing small particles, and different photo scatter masks that we utilize and obscuration bars help us enhance the resolution and dynamic range. Also, the ability to threshold of any parameter or laser line is very important. A lot of the work that we do with certain instrumentation, uh, we tend to use a to threshold um, to trigger off a 561 laser line. And uh, in addition to the instrumentation, we have the aspheric imaging focusing lenses, which are optimized to collect the scattered light from the core stream and image it into the pinhole so we can get the signal and, and see what we have. So the ability to manually control the sample, the sample speed of the particles, it's very important, along with dilutions, extremely important as well and maximizes the amount of laser interrogation at a slower microliter per minute flow rate. And also, in addition, the hydrodynamic focusing is also enhanced to limit the ability of particle uh, clustering and as seen as the uh, bench stop analyzers that we're using, such as, such as the Cytoflex. And we will proceed. We'll, uh, we'll look at a picture of the Cytoflex here, and this is uh, for demonstration purposes to, to see the different laser lines that we use in order to excite, uh, to trigger our events, and also uh, a visual of the APDs and PMTs that we use for the collection, uh, for collection purposes. This is the uh, inside of the Cytoflex with the, uh, uh, with the APDs and the uh, dichroids. We will proceed with um, a schematic of one of the other instruments that we use and how we pay attention, how we have the blue rays from uh, the particles, so how the scattered light in the center of the core stream goes and then they converge through a lens to a 200 micro, micron pinhole in order to see our events. And on the bottom, you see a design of the dual four scattered PMTs on the Astros EQ with the enhanced optics and uh, uh, the dual enhanced PMTs. And we see the scattering of the light and collecting our events. Here is an example of the former paradigm and the new paradigm in regards to instrumentation. So before the technical hardware enhancements uh, of our instruments, we're looking at the 880 um, nanometer beads uh, without fluorescence. Um, we can, you know, we see them clearly from noise, uh, but once we apply those enhancements to the instrument, we see the increase of the dynamic range, and we can definitely differentiate between 200 nanometers and 800 nanometers with enough uh, dynamic range to also see in there at the 450 nanometers. So the, the uh, improvements work you know, quite tremendous and, and dramatic in such a short period of time to be able to to help us advance our research um, in the extra uh, cellular vesicle uh, field. Here we see a picture of uh, PCS controls, and we see how the signal-to-noise ratio has uh, been enhanced. Uh, to the left, we see a picture on uh, Astrios uh, prior to the dual four uh, scatter PMT enhancement and you see the, the 100 nanometer and the 200 nanometer beads. And to the right, we see the Astrios EQ, and we see the dynamic range between 
the 100 and the 200 nanometer beads. And then we can also see the 500s. Okay, so sizing controls. So we have different sizing controls in order to set our ranges. We can use beads and biologicals. So we can use those for initial alignment and QA and QC of, and, and generate a sizing curve of our instrumentation. And we're going to discuss a couple methods that were developed by the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center Flow Cytometry Corps, along with uh, some of our Harvard researchers, and uh, in collaboration with uh, ASTH, ISEV, and ISEC uh, members. We are going to start by discussing photon correlation spectroscopy beads. One of the reasons that we did like those beads and we start using them is because they don't have any fluorescence. <laughs> we knew the size of the bead, um, and uh, photon correlation spe uh, spe uh, spectroscopy beads are controls which are uniform. So they're uniform latex particles intended for quality control and analysis of dynamic light scatter instrumentation. We thought if that works for dynamic light scatter instrumentation, it should give us a pretty good range of um, range in regards to the particles that we would like to look at. So PCS controls beads, they're also varying sizes, and that's very important to us, setting our ranges, and they vary between 100 and 500 nanometers. And basically, the measurements, again, can be based solely on scatter detection and confirm the scatter distribution of them. Here we see uh, a schematic. And this is acquired with our Astrios EQ with the enhanced uh, four scatter PMTs. Um, I believe this is a straight shot without the beam splitter into uh, four scatter one. Um, just try to get you know the most out of our laser light, um, uh, and we see the distribution here between 200, 300, 400, and, and 500 beads. And here we see the the hundreds on the lower uh, left hand side. The dynamic rates is pretty impressive, and then. Photocorrelation spectroscopy beads are great, but they don't uh, provide any fluorescence information, so we want to double check that. So we started using the dragon green beads. Dragon green beads are made from banks laboratories. They have uh, the range in, in size between 190 and 780 nanometers. They're a very good substitute for the uh, fluorescein, so we can use it. Um, it's a great surrogate, so we can use the fluorescein filters that we already have in our instrumentation. They're very common, so a 530-30 or a 525 bandpass will work great. Uh, so we have different sizes and fluorescence, fluorescence, which is very important, so we can cal calculate our different values. And by using beads of different sizes and fluorescence intensities, we can optimize our flow cytometry for small particle detection. Here we see an example of four of the uh, scatters of the beads and fluorescence uh, as acquired on our cytoflex. And then again, we can see the, the nice dynamic range between 192 and 780 nanometers based on fluorescence and scatter, which is uh, pretty impressive. So um, we do have our standards, and um, we decided to add one more in a palette of beads, uh, and those would be the apogee beads. So we start with uh, photon coloration spectroscopy beads. We add our uh, Banks beads, with, which have um, the fluorescein uh, fluorescence. And then apogee beads are a mixture of fluorescent silica particles and the fluorescent latex particles. So we have different, different refract refractive indices within those beads. They range between 110 nanometers and 1300 nanometers. And the 180s, 240s, 300s, 590s, 80, 80, 880s, and 1300 uh, diameter beads, they have uh, a refractive index of 1.43, whereas at 110s and 500s, they have green fluorescence, and the refractive index is 1.59. When we run those on our flow cytometer, uh, flow cytometer on our Astrios EQ, um, we see a very nice distribution, um, and we can set a pretty good range uh, in regards to the four size scatter in order detecting, in order to detect our extracellular vesicles. So the known, the known size of concentration and refractive index of those beads also helps tremendously setting uh, 
a pretty good quality and set some as a pretty good quality control in, all, in order to set the instrument for uh, EV detection. Now, so we have uh, photon correlation uh, spectroscopy beads. We have the Banks beads with flor uh, fluorescence. We have the Apogee beads, which is a mixture of beads with different refractive indices, um, fluorescence versus non-fluorescence. And this is great, but are beads the best? Can we do something better? Can we use a biological in order to, uh, as a control, in order to set our instruments' uh, range? Well, uh, looking at liposomes was one we were work we were working with a group that uh, had a great interest in liposomes, so we were able to obtain some of them with known sizes and and run them in our instrument. So we ran the 100 nanometer uh, liposomes, and then we also decided to run some 400 nanometer liposomes. As you can see from the picture to the right, the 100 nanometers and 400 nanometers pretty much come in the same in the same area in the same range. So one of the problems that we have is we can really generate a sizing curve. So we have issue with monodispersity, so when we try to overlay them in order to, to, to generate some type of sizing curve, it's pretty much not working and it doesn't set them up for a good uh, biological control. Another idea that we had was to uh, try and use um, some viruses. So we went ahead and uh, we obtained some viral particles. And here we'll see on the next slide, we run them on our Astros EQ. And uh, there were vital particles of uh, known size. So to the left, uh, I believe we run the Epstein Barr virus, which is about uh, 120 nanometers. And to the right, we run uh, some, uh, if I'm not mistaken, some HIV viral particles uh, between 80 and 100 nanometers. And I get my slides uh, slowing down a little bit. Here we see the difference. Again, with the, with the vital, vital particles, um, same thing, issues with not being able to generate uh, a sizing curve. So lack of ability to generate, to derive a sizing curve, and they're not as easy to work with. The biologicals that we've tried um, haven't been excellent in helping us generate um, a range looking at our uh, um, extracellular vesicles. Hence, we, we fall back into the three different types of beads that we use in order to QA and QC our instrumentation. So, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to uh, pass on the presentation to John Tiggs. Um, here's to you, John, back in Boston, and I will join you towards the end for the Q&A, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Hello, and thank you, Vasilis. Uh, picking up here, we're going to be looking at uh, some different things that are needed to be considered uh, when looking at these particles. So most importantly, obviously, is the size of the biological particle, is uh, identifying your range, what your target is, uh, and, you know, know what you're aiming at before you shoot, right? So very simple concept, uh, our relevant markers, what can we use to label them, what's most efficient, and uh, what should we stay away from. Also, what we want to look at is the available fluorescence of those markers and beads so that we have matching pairs of what we have, uh, matching to the MESF, which tends to be in the uh, FITSI range um, only. That's uh, off the 488 and about a 525. Very similar to the things that Vasilis was talking about as far as controls with like Apogee Bs and Dragon Greens. Uh, we also want to know, are we going to be using those markers and are we looking at the fluorescence only? So should we trigger off the fluorescence or should we stick to traditional type scatter methodologies? Uh, this way we can see almost everything that goes on, not lose anything. However, sometimes it's impossible to see the smaller ones as they get trapped in the noise. And fluorescence triggering is our most beneficial. So. There are other things that we need to consider also once we've done that. We need to worry about our sheath purity. Um, we need to worry about hemolysis of the sample. 
So Sheath Purity, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, as we go along. Um, we want to know what our collection media is. Are we using, uh, you know, saliva? Are we using urine? Are we using uh, plasma, serum, any of the uh, multitude of different type samples that we can find these uh, extracellular vesicles in? We want to know how we're storing them. What's the best method of storage? Uh, can we freeze? Can we thaw afterwards uh, to get the best results? How to thaw actually is uh, what I should be saying. Uh, and then in addition, should they always be fresh or how does that go? Also, the refractive index of the particles. This is why the apogees made it into the realm of what we needed to do as uh, it was a known refractive index. So knowing the refractive index of your particles related to your you know, the bead material that you're using will also help in setting up relative sizing curves or uh, using things that can do concentrations and such. So, you know, there is obviously a lot of things to consider here uh, as we go along. And why is it so important? Why do we care so much about these things? Well, we've made a lot of different type mistakes and we've seen a lot of issues. And so we go through these just to hopefully help somebody with a, to lessen the headache. So here you can see this is just simply on an Astrios EQ with a differing uh, mass that you can use. Um, we tested all the mass, found that the P1 mask, as Vasilis pointed out previously, was our best bet. As you can see here by the, uh, the blue arrows, followed by their, their friends, I believe, the green arrows, uh, there is a difference in where these guys sit on a forward and side scatter as far as log decades go. And this is actually both polystyrene 200 nanometer beads just made from different manufacturers. As you can see, the one on the left, uh, obviously a little bit better on its quality control. Uh, we won't give away who's who. And, uh, and not so much on the other. So this kind of causes problems also, uh, starting to think, okay, well, if we're setting these things up, what else do we need to know? Uh, you know, who's making them and what is the criteria for sizing them? Uh, a lot of them, if you read the packaging, gives uh, very uh, ranges. Uh, so they can be anywhere from, you know, it's a 200 nanometer bead and they tell you from 170 to 220. So it's very difficult because if you're trying to set things up where you can separate out twos from threes from one uh, 100 nanometer beads, and those ranges are so big, then you're going to have lots of overlap. So there has to be a little more uh, diligence in, in how we look at these things. And I know there's lots of good things that uh, have been suggested through uh, collaborative groups that have been mentioned, uh, such as the NIST uh, traceable beads. So that's one way to go. The picture that we have up here now to get back to the slide presentation here is off again the Astro CQ and looking at basically 500 nanometer uh, beads in silica, latex, and polystyrene. And you can just see how the differing materials also tease out to be different. And that's a factor of the refractive index and a little bit of the density of the beads. Here we're going to talk about um, getting false uh, populations. So here what seems to be a beautiful population of uh, extracellular vesicles derived from red blood cells uh, is actually just a <laughs> very bad tube. So my little picture will pop up, and you know you put these into Eppendorf's, and as you're ultracentrifuging, we've got to remember that we're looking at a very low N. So anything that can contaminate, um, not only can it, but it will. So you have to expect that if something small gets into the soup, you will see it. Here, that big population just happened to be uh, shedding of the plastic from the tube. So we were picking up a wonderful population of plastic pieces that were all stuck together uh, that came out of the supernatan. What else can cause us some problems like this? False uh, positives as we put them. Well, next we can look at how are we collecting uh, stuff. So here we can see that it punctures. So not only is it the needle, the needle gauge, the where you take the blood from, you have to remember that any antagonist is going to cause a, you know, influx of these extracellular vesicles to the wound site. But it's not exactly what we may be looking for to do any kind of analysis or to see fluctuations in just normal uh, disease states or any other kind of, um, you know, physical, you know, body functions that are going on. So it's also... Looking at this, you can see some blebbing here on the bottom where the arrow is and not so much on the last. 
So we've decided, okay, we need to take care of that and remove the first ML always and then look at the blood. The other is not only do we worry about the needle, the gauge, and what's going on on that end, but we have to think about, oh, what are we collecting into? So now we've got a whole problem in, in just the, the actual taking of these, and I believe there is a position paper on stuff like this that came out of uh, the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, and giving all these different characteristics and best practices to avoid them uh, contaminating and becoming a major issue in your research. Here you can see that, you know, when you're conscious of collection, you're also conscious of calcium, magnesium, uh, pH, and anything that can interfere and cause the false positives again. Uh, on the left, you can see that the different calcium chelators and, you know, complement three interference is causing fake populations due to the actual collection media compared to the complement mindfuls where you're not getting a bunch of false. And this is all just from the same uh, individual that was sampled through the different tubes. What else? Well, we just keep going with things that can go wrong. Hopefully we'll tell you something good soon. Um, fresh, frozen, what works? Well, when we say frozen, we don't want it to be mistaken as actually uh, you can't just freeze them down like you would normally cells and then use them again. This is collecting and then automatically putting them into, say, uh, ice uh, collection. What happens is, like us, when you get cold, we want to huddle together. Uh, well, they do the same thing. They huddle together, and it causes what you see on the left is just a, a massive fusion of the particles uh, and really disrupts the distribution. Now, the only thing with that is if you had a bunch of this, maybe it's not the worst ever. Uh, it's all gone bad. As if all the samples do, are acting the same, we tend to look at trends. So if things change amongst, then you can still make some sort of uh, conclusions, but I would stay away from it because you're only opening yourself to a bunch of questions you do not want to answer. You'd rather see beautiful things as such as on the right-hand side with the multiple populations of exosomes and EVs that can be characterized and looked at. Also, we're going to talk about hemolysis, which we mentioned, uh, hemoglobin and the heme factor. And this is spiked in uh, different levels of hemoglobin, causing the hemolysis. And as you can see, we start to get what would look like very nice populations. And as you keep increasing this, you can see that it exponentially increases uh, and causing more and more problems and causing more and more headaches. Uh, not being aware of this, you can really set yourself up for what you would think would be a great diagnosis versus uh, what is actually real. And the real one should come up momentarily, showing this same sample uh, without the hemolysis and, and just a normal activation of these EVs so that we can see them beautifully and perfect. And as you can see, the representative picture that we always have with the different exosome populations and extracellular vesicles. So what else can possibly go wrong? Well, noise. Noise is inevitable to any kind of flow cytometry experiment. Most of the times you are not dealing with things that are so low that your PMT is going to actually pick them up and show them as signal. Or they can be easily rectified by just a realignment of the instrument, such as looking at drop drive. Because you're usually so high and the tip goes to a certain point, you're never going to see these in your, in your PMTs or APDs um, in this particular instance. When you're talking about drop drive, though, it's mostly PMTs on a sorter. The PMTs, too, there are many papers out mentioning through uh, anything that with PMTs, APDs, you're talking about dark noise or what they call shot noise. And there's lots of ways to try to eliminate that through Peltier cooling or, you know, most of the time you are not looking that low again. So there is low-end noise and high-end noise that can come off of them. And then I did say that I would get back to sheath, and here it is. Uh, these particular water bottles are pure because they say so. Uh, but no, HPLC grade type, uh, you know, sheath fluids works very well. Uh, also, on the Astrios EQ, it goes through a particular filter that was set up particularly for this type of analysis, allowing for um, purer, cleaner things. And uh, we did this type analysis also using the different type grades uh, of HPLC and also using just the Astros EQ as is and pre-filtered sheath. And basically they all look the same where just looking at background noise on the left, uh, setting a threshold to a certain level and looking at it and then 
running through just PBS on its own without any other uh, anything in it. It's just in the same tube. You're using the same conditions, and you can see it looks exactly the same. This is the effect that you want to have. Uh, if you get too much uh, different noise in there, or you contaminate your PBS you're using, or you know whatever your Del Becos uh, solution there. Uh, basically, you end up with what looks like a giant mess. Um, you got to remember that any kind of thing that gets in there, whether it's debris, dust, dirt, uh, bacteria, anything that can be seen on that low end will be. Again, it's the will be. Um, here we see, again, this looks like beautiful populations going on. This is just PBS that was absolutely filthy as an uh, exaggerated example of what can happen. But it also brought us to another conclusion when talking to a, you know, our colleague Jennifer Jones at the NIH. Dr. Jones says, well, if we have these type things here and we can eliminate almost all with the sheath and, and whatnot, but we still have this little bit of noise going on, why don't we use it to our advantage, as it says here? The best way to destroy your enemy, befriend them. So especially here, uh, we're going to show that if we use the noise, it's almost at acting as an internal control. And Dr. Jones did a lot of work on this and using it so that you knew from day in and day out, if you set the machine to a certain level and you had the population of noise at a certain place and you started running samples, it should not move. It's constant and it's consistent and it should always be there. It's like having a bead control uh, right into the sample. So... It's thought of, and we have used it as an internal control, almost like a bead. Okay, more bad news. <laughs> I just keep going with the bad news. Hopefully it gets better. So this is uh, what happened with Dr. Edwin Vanderpoel, and he put out, published a paper about the swarm or coincidence that occurs. Uh, this is a very well-known in cytometry itself, but it tends to show itself uh, even further with the use of these small particles. Uh, it's just a tendency that many of them can get through simultaneously. We already saw that if they get cold, they will fuse. Uh, other things will cause them to fuse together. And you end up with these very large populations. And when these are excited by a laser, uh, they tend to make everything look bigger. Obviously, if we stack a bunch of 100 nanometer things on top of each other, eventually we get to something that looks more like a 500 nanometer type particle. It's the same type thing that you would see as we, uh, I'm about to show, uh, you know, swarming effects of, you know, insects. Uh, and, you know, in the summer you can see, you know, bugs in, on your, in the front of your lawn just all clustered together. Singly, you wouldn't see any. But all together, you can actually see them as a basic cloud. Uh, and that's what happens the same thing when you look at this coincidence. Well, it can be to your advantage, but it also messes up when you want to look at concentrations. Obviously, clustering of things does not give an accurate account of what is actually in your sample. As far as seeing them, it does make it better. As you can see here under the, the fluorescent microscope, as they cluster, they become brighter green and easier to see and detect. But like I said, it doesn't lend itself, obviously, to what everybody wants in science and flow cytometry or any cytometry, and that is single uh, particle deposition or single particle analysis. So what do you do? Well, Edwin and his group uh, got, you know, started and said, well, like anything else, what if we just serial dilute? And as we dilute down, the coincidence rate should decrease, and each one should be, you know, as the dilution goes up, it should be an exponential or logarithmic uh, downfall. And you can actually see this if you've done any of these experiments as you uh, increase pressure, differentials, or speeds, you get kind of like a wave up and go higher into the levels. Uh, whereas if you look at things through the dilution, you should get a better picture of what's going on, and you also, for counting methodologies, it's much more effective. So, bad, 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 but maybe now some good. Nanofacts, once again, this is uh, what we've talked about with our NIH and Stanford uh, collaborative uh, that we have going. Uh, there was a partial pattern on the whole nanofacts terms and its methodology. Here we moved it to the Astros EQ from other instrumentation, and it allows for sorting. So not only are we doing microscopy, we're not only analyzing, but now can we sort them? Well, we started off big because, well, we didn't want to just 
jeopardize everything we were working for and aim too low where we wouldn't get any results. So we just looked at some bigger stuff, still below the level of the platelet red blood cell, and we decided, okay, let's sort them. Let's see what we have. And so we took the two populations and we sorted them out and then put them back through the machine. Uh, as they were bees, we could just take a, a lots and lots of them because now we have two separate populations anyways to go with. And here you can see uh, we did very well above 90% uh, on each for the actual uh, recovery. It was very good, actually a little surprising. Uh, but we did take the noise out of the equation on this particular one so that our percentages weren't influenced by taking away 50 to 60% just based on noise. And we looked at them also through the Q-Nano, uh, the pores, to make sure that you know, we were looking at beads of the pro appropriate size, and here you can see it's basically a 500 and a 700 nanometer beads that we were able to sort out. Just a confirmation, a uh, simple experiment to do to make sure that we could see them, could sort them. The other way to do it is in, in the sorting methodology is not only that, but let's, let's go further. Let's look inside in vivo and in vitro. So here we look at EVs hopefully in the circulation, and we know they come from all different cell types. We wanted to have a methodology with our researchers that would allow us to kind of trace and see what was happening, isolate the particular cells of interest, and then look at this uh, ROSA um, mouse line. And the ROSA MTMG mouse line is important because we look at what is actually a Cree-type locks model, where the Cree switches the locks and things that are tomato turn green in this particular one. So you have the mice and you put in the uh, cardiac EVs that, that have uh, the tomato color, and if they actually go in and they make that switch, then you will see cardiac cells that are green. So as I said, the two things like this, as I keep wanting to hit home, is that Nanofax is more of a methodology than just a derivation of a flow cytometric assay. You know, put it on a sorter, do this. It's more of a beginning to end type thing and looking at many different categories to see best practices. So here is just the, the GFPs on the uh, bottom right versus the tomatoes on the upper left. And this is the pre-fluorescent uh, microscopy pictures of the greens and the reds from the particular mouse model, and also with a dark field image uh, here to show all of them together. As you can see, it does appear, though, that your greens tend to be a little bit larger um, in size, or maybe it's just the way the fluorescence is represented. Uh, not exactly sure on that one, but we can also see here that the populations are very kind of clearly defined. You can see I put a little gate up top R7 to show basically where those uh, tomatoes kind of lie, and then this other population that's a little more lower than that um, is happens to be the GFPs. And what we did is we decided, okay, let's take those two populations, isolate them. And so we sorted them, and here you can see we have, again, the fluorescent images of the reds and the greens, and the distribution that came about once the uh, analysis was done through uh, microRNAs. And here, the relative expression of red uh, EVs and green EVs in this particular study. And so by putting the sorting together with the microRNA analysis and the Cree LOX model, you're able to start telling a story. And that story moved on to looking at uh, more type uh, cellular analysis of where did they actually go throughout the system. And here you can start seeing a little bit of the green dots uh, appearing. They're labeled with the cardiomyocyte-derived EVs and where they end up. And they kind of go throughout the system, which was very interesting and still being uh, looked at to see where do they home to and then uh, what is the final analysis. So here we can see that the plasma EVs flow cytometry, we say. But it's more of a cytometry itself type assay that's being developed. Because you have the flow component where we can see things, we can sort things. You have components of microscopy where you're looking at and trying to identify even more specifically, uh, especially with like a, a, the tapping method of an atomic force. And you can I, see the population, size them, and get a generalized concentration. And then using things such as a Q-Nano or NanoSite, you can start getting a distribution of the EV size and some concentration. So like I said, it's trying to put together a full picture. Um, here we're just looking at, okay, can we do the same thing with different instruments? And using just a sample uh, from plasma, 
you can see that the populations of interest show the same relative percentages, whether you're using a big fancy sorter or a benchtop analyzer. Um, it really depends on just what you're looking for. Am I just wanting to analyze or do I want to do more downstream applications? So let's get to some examples so we can get to a little more of the positive uh, and hopefully get through this without too much pain for you. As uh, you might be able to tell, I like I, you know, show my passion, so I ramble a little bit. So the examples that we're going to touch base with here are, you know, CRT, our cardiac resynchronization therapy uh, with heart failures, reperfusion that we have, some lipoproteins. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, SLE, the uh, lupus model that was done, EOs, and uh, circadian rhythms. So let's move forward on what we're going to be uh, talking about, um, exercise being the last one, which kind of goes a little bit with the, the cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, but I did tease it out because it can be put across more of a, a generic model than just in a cardiac situation. So the first thing we'll talk about is papers here by uh, colleagues of ours um, and uh, ourselves here at uh, Beth Israel in the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, the role of extracellular vesicles in heart failure and cellular electrical remodeling. This started with a paper from uh, the cardiology group here at Beth Israel with uh, circulating microRNA30D and is using it as kind of a response predictor in the success of the, the left ventricle uh, procedure. And so basically it was seen that these guys carried the necessary microRNA, which could tell previous, um, which would be basically a 0% diagnostic to about a 60% efficiency. So it, it did end up being that microRNA 30D could, could really help in this type situation. And, you know, this is derived, obviously, from the extracellular vesicles uh, from the cardiac cells. And how does that actually happen? Well, what happens is you get your induced pluripotent stem cells, and those turn into myocytes, which are helpful to the survival and protection and proliferation of your your cells in the heart. And then we analyze the microRNA. So these were taken and, and done with a Kyogen kits to look at the microRNAs. And, and the initial study had hundreds upon hundreds of microRNAs done in the library. Uh, then we were asked to look at them flow cytometrically to see if there was differences. And as you can see here in percentages, of the actual uh, plasma from the you know the SVTs and then the red blood cell derived fraction, uh, the ex extracellular vesicles. There are differences between those who are just SVT patients and those that have actual heart failure. Um, and when asked why we used SVT patients instead of normals to actually compare, is I was told that you can't just go along cracking open the chest of normal people, uh, healthy individuals, to check on their <laughs> extracellular vesicles. It made sense, but um, I guess you work with what you have. So, But they were all basic same age and uh, all other factors being somewhat relative. Here we look at actual what we, is the ischemia um, reperfusion type uh, injury that happens uh, in the myocardium and you know the heart's a muscle it can only take so much and uh, and eventually you can overwork that muscle so here it was actually the MSCs that we looked at uh, that this particular group and then the cardiology group that we have here then also did the same type model a little bit different taking the cardiac stem cells and looking at eventually the proteins that were associated with this uh, protective function and this led a lot also to looking at extracellular vesicles and exosomes uh, with labeling that the heat shock proteins were involved and there was a certain uh, toll-like receptor and ERK process that happened. You had a lot of uh, different molecules that would cause like a, a pore in which would allow the exosomes free travel in and out and would cause a cardio protection so that after ischemia, the reperfusion would not overwork the hot muscle and it would be uh, much better for the diagnostically or prognostically also for the patient. Uh, I guess all of the above. So just another little great thing for those of you who may be having some sort of hypertension or heart failure or anything else uh, with the, the your cardiac cells. Also, there was a position paper here from the same uh, Journal of Extracellular Vesicles groups and talking about how 
here you can see the labeled uh, extracellular vesicle getting into the, uh, the cardiomyocyte. So just a nice little example of how these type things happen. And we did some of the flow on this also to see the difference between uh, the ischemia type uh, situation and then what happened when it was re reperfused and seeing the different populations that would exist. Moving right along to the lipoproteins from human plasma, um, lipoproteins have a, a huge factor in this as lipoproteins are not only uh, extremely important uh, in the same things we were talking about with, with your, your heart, but also that they are in a lot of the serum, the plasma, you see a lot of lipoproteins. You see, you can actually start seeing LDLs and VLDLs on your, your flow when you get down to these levels. And here, basically, we were looking at uh, increased risk for the heart disease using ApoB as a marker. And this particular study then took the, that type format to say, okay, how can we have a predictor or, you know, is there any prediction that's there? But the more important part of this actual study is the following. Uh, the basic fractions that were done in this study were taken, and they did a UV absorption and got different fractions. They alluded out at certain points and took all these different uh, fractions of VLDL or LDL. And as you can see, they then labeled these with the apob Fitzy. And you can see that there's a correlation, a direct correlation between number of particles that were isolated in the UV absorbent solution fractions and the actual height of the peak of the ApoB. While there's not a big difference in fluorescence intensity, there is a height difference, which is your particle count, which meaning that there, you could actually see particles that were down in the 30 nanometer range when looking directly at fluorescence. So for us, this was this was huge. Um, got us a little giddy, actually. Uh, the lupus project was something that was done by our collaborator, Dr. Giron, and looking at the groups here with Dr. Kataris, who had the patients uh, in rheumatology clinics that, you know, very normal butterfly look during a reaction, and there, you know, the rosacea that that occurs. It's an autoimmune disease, as uh, most do know. And what happens is you get an increase in the actual microparticle uh, levels here. Now, as you can see, there's a, a lot more that is just directly into the left-hand side there. And these tend to start to move up and out uh, pre-breakout. Uh, so this could, a paper was written, you know, describing how this could be used to detect when an episode would occur and then to treat it before it actually became uh, an issue. So it would be more of a a treatment than just trying to treat the symptoms uh, in the end. Furthermore, moving along to our next little study that uh, groups uh, and collaborators were very nice to share with us or that we were part of here at the, in Harvard. We are moving along. This was uh, EOS, uh, microparticle isolation. So this was just a, a very nice look at tetraspanin markers and the ability to identify EOs or uh, lipid bodies and, and other things that would be in somebody who eventually may have some sort of pulmonary type issue or asthma, uh, allergic reactions, things that could increase your EOs or, um, you know, the factors involved with that, any kind of the inflammation that, that would occur. And here you can see that there was uh, some nice reaction with the CD9 FITSI compared to the CD63 FITSI tetraspanin. Um, it would be nice to move on and see if the CD9 works best, you know, is there different labels that would be better, different clones and such. Uh, but a nice little check here to make sure that you could see them and identify them. And I think we're moving on to some of the, the last things here with detection of complemented generated EVs. Uh, so basically complement factors have a huge effect on EV uh, production and actually them showing. Uh, it's thought that channels are, are opened and, and they can be released much easier when you uh, open a pore using the complement factors and certain complement factors when aligned in a way will cause a ring and the ring will allow for the exchange of materials in and out of the cell. 
So when all the complement factors are correct, you can see here the traditional look where you have the red blood cell derived EVs and then the exosomes on the bottom compared to the two tops where it seems is almost like uh, non uh, factors, complement factors taken out are actually causing uh, a blockage of the EV release. And I believe finally the exercise induced. This is a study that is, I believe, closing up now. It's a collaboration between uh, groups here at the Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and uh, a few different clinics in China. And looking at, okay, stress to the heart based on uh, exercise. You know, everybody, exercise is great, but again, the heart's a muscle. You can only work it so much before it's going to get overworked. So basically what they did is they took uh, individuals, some normals, um, normal just explaining that they were had no previous known uh, cardiovascular issues and didn't really have major risk factors diabetes, uh, smoker, heavy alcohol user, and tried to use um, relatively younger individuals, uh, but age uh, was not really, a, um, I mean, their female male was not really a, a major factor on that one, even though the cohorts were put together. So there was about 100 individuals, and so they rested, uh, went to uh, peak type exercise, and then were left to recover. And if you take the baselines and the peaks and recoveries, you can see that there's differences in what is going on. Also, what we did here is we looked a little bit at um, some other previous studies we did at looking at time also in these. In the same subject, doing the same thing, collected at different times, uh, giving, does it give different results and what are the differences and do they affect what's going on? So we tried to keep everything as... Uh, you know, any kind of controlled experiments, right? Cut out any of the unnecessary X factors and, and go with what you know. So, in summary, we've learned a lot about controls uh, from Vasilis and what type of diagnostics or anything else that we may possibly in the future be able to do with these. And they're throughout all kinds of modalities of, of disease. And there are many different techniques that are established and, and used all not to perfection, but uh, many groups are working to change that and have standards uh, and, and quality controls put into these type studies when, you know, with the microscopy and the resurgence of dark field to look at these type particles and pulse resistance, the Q-nano, uh, you know, it, it works very well as long as we know generally our size so we can use the pore correctly, otherwise we just clog the pore and can't get good results but lots have been done to look at the particular size and confirm the size. Dynamic light scatter um, used a, a lot of times in, in particle sizing matrix and the nanosite, which is uh, a staple. If you read any of these papers, you'll find NTA results uh, in, the, in almost all of them. I can't remember if I've read one that hasn't had that data in it. And we keep improving instrumentation. So there are permutations of, of what we're talking about and these hardware modifications throughout, uh, a lot of them being obviously home brews, uh, you know, the DYI type method where you have people maybe taking existing instruments and changing them to benefit, uh, you know, this type science or just building their own from scratch and using, uh, you know, what has been tried and going along with those roots of what was successful, what wasn't, and let's build better. So many papers to look at these instruments, improve the light scattering, use polarization, use imaging, and tie it all in together. Because at the end of the day, all papers and every all research are just a big story, and you want your story to be complete. So what we tried to do is make uh, a few enhancements to our, our already very robust uh, instrumentation and look at what worked best in our studies. And, you know, obviously increasing the optics, lessening the noise is going to be the best bet to get to approximately 100, maybe lower, uh, depending on, you know, which instrument and how, you know, how steadfast you are in all the things we talked about, especially your sheath purity and keeping all your your physics in order, I guess, uh, your dichroics and everything clean. It, it, from sheath to, to optics, everything needs to be clean throughout one of these systems in order to get uh, very accurate and, and wonderful results. And so we keep coming up with 
greater and better type technology to keep doing it, increasing what we can do. Um, as you saw, there are probably more pitfalls than there are successes. And so, you know, the theory of null, if you mess everything up, eventually you have to be right. Um, but we're still looking for that, what is the best QAQC? What, how can we standardize this? Um, not everybody's going to have the same instrument, but if there's a, a basic protocol that you can follow, at least the data that you are generating and how you you know, actually put it out to others will be very well defined, and this way there are guidelines and, and you can have a very successful experiment. And no one particular method is perfect. Um, we don't think ours is, uh, you know, but we've We've tried a lot of stuff to be getting, you know, closer and closer to what would be deemed uh, acceptable. And so, as I keep putting, Nanofax is a multifaceted protocol. It's a methodology. It, it takes on many different uh, faces. It takes on many different uh, uh, technologies and basic uh, setup and, you know, and, and analysis to get to what is particular and to have a full uh, – analysis of what you are doing and to identify your particles of interest. So just going here, there are some uh, basic posters and papers that we have done, uh, and a lot of them that have been mentioned today, you can grab the references off the slides and uh, look them up on PubMed. Our collaborators, I've mentioned uh, Dr. Jones uh, multi-times, multi uh, her colleague at the uh, National Institutes of Health and National Cancer Institute, Bill Telford, uh, who is very helpful in, uh, in optics and lasers and everything else that may and may not work. Uh, Kirsty Danielson, a great colleague who was at MGH but has since opened her own lab in her home of New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Das, um, who comes up with a lot of these great ideas in the cardiology realm. Uh, our former technician, uh, Virginia Camacho, who is now at UAB, and Dr. James Felton, uh, a wonderful physicist and a great mind who, without him, I would have never been able to align <laughs> or get some of this information. A lot of acknowledgments to go around, uh, obviously, and when you start talking about things on this magnitude, uh, there's a lot of hands involved, and I'm sure we might have missed even some uh, others that could have been mentioned. So... Vasilis and I would like to thank you very much for uh, listening to the original live webinar and being able to download this one. And uh, if you have questions, I'm sure you can find us on the web and, and hit us up. We'd be uh, more than happy to answer what we can. And uh, thank you again for your, your time and effort. And I'd uh, like to thank uh, Wiley and, uh, for helping us with this and making sure that it was a complete success. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. So, as you say, let's go ahead to the question and answer segment. So, if those of you watching haven't yet submitted a question for our speakers, now is the perfect time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. So, let's go ahead and see what questions have come in so far. So, the first is, can you specify how you could minimize the impurities in the exosomes extracted from a cancer cell line supernatant? Um, okay. From a cancer cell line supernatant. Okay, so we have done that. It's uh, Cancer cells in general have a lot more debris uh, to them, even just during normal flow cytometry analysis. We've actually been did it yesterday, and uh, it was one of the comments I was talking about with the researcher. So having to do this, there are, I mean, everybody's trying to put out kits that can possibly do some sort of uh, bead separation or attach it to a certain, um, whether it be one of the tetraspanins or other type markers that are specific for the line. I know we have worked with a group uh, that has isolated it and put it to like a MUC1 in a breast cancer cell line. So there's not, unfortunately, there's not a simple way of doing any of these. There is sort of a, you know, filtration type method also. Uh, if you look those up, there are you know, much work done in papers that are out there uh, with, you know, gradients that, that can be done to kind of isolate and remove the debris that exists. All right. So I should say to John and Vasilis, um, you'll have to just jump in for who wants to answer a question, and, and maybe both of you will. But um, 
you know better than I who, sh- who should be answering the various questions. All right, so the next question is, how do you ensure singlet discrimination on the sort besides sample dilution? You, you cannot really uh, discriminate singlets uh, at those sizes. Uh, so dilution, serial dilutions is your best uh it's your best chance to try to eliminate that. Those particles are so small and they they are rigid and they tend to fuse together. Um, there's always going to be um, not an absolute singlet discrimination. So it's it's part of the uh, you know it's part of what we we are dealt with and there's no way right now for us to be effective uh, discriminating singlets. Okay, on to the next question. Uh, what laser powers are being used? Uh, the, standard, uh, the, the standard lasers on the Astros EQ uh, as they come off the manufacturer, um, that should be available on the Beckman Coulter website uh, under the instrument specs. It's a 200 milliwatt blue, uh, the 488. It, uh, in, we use on the Astros EQ the 561, which is 150 milliwatts. So, uh, but those are, as Vasilis said, stand, pretty standard at this point. The, the PMTs are standard as far as uh, at this point in the, the latest iteration. Um, they are a, a little more high-powered. Uh, the number eludes me at the moment, but it's all basically worked through uh, Hamamatsu. Okay, on to the next question. Um, have you studied EVs? In paraffinized tissues, and if yes, what kind of technique uh, do you use, or have you used? We we have not. We've only dealt with uh, fresh samples. Yeah, paraffin. Uh, that it may be very difficult, as when you get to these lower levels of analysis, you see everything. Um, we, as I said, we saw the plastic that was shedding from tubes. We've seen uh, also. Filters that were in our, our equipment, we actually have seen how uh, they've shed off. When we were doing atomic force microscopy, we were getting things that looked like honeycombs, only to find that they were pieces of the uh, inline sheet filter uh, from the instrument. So that would, be, that would be something interesting to investigate, though, absolutely. All right. Um, on to the next question then. Uh, how should frozen EV samples be handled to avoid the fusion that you mentioned? From my experience, and maybe you Pacillus can also add to it, what we found was that um, it's like freezing any type other sample with a kind of a slow freeze step and the same thing coming back is bringing them back to room temperature very slowly. So it's not just pulling them out and letting them sit there and thaw. It's kind of putting them into um, ice and letting them come up gradually to try to avoid. Now, I know this sounds contrary to what I have said, saying that if you immediately put them into ice, they fuse. Um, They're already frozen, so it's kind of a a very slow uh, process to bring them back, allowing them to acclimate at each point instead of just either a a flash freeze or a flash thaw. And then the thing to understand with this, uh, with uh, extracellular vesicles, this is something that uh, we we are still learning and we're still trying to develop, and it's it's a work in progress. Um, what works now, uh, it may not work as well in the future because we have this, we'll probably discover new ways and methods to do it better. So. Okay, um, we're up on the hour, but there are a ton of great questions. So I'm going to keep going for a few minutes over. Uh, hopefully that's all right with everybody. So the next question is, for a given cell condition medium, can you measure and sort the relative amounts of exosomes, microvesicles, and apoptotic bodies? I'm going to say yes with a caveat. Um, so, yes, you can because they should separate, uh, especially the apoptotic bodies from the exosomes. You should be able to see the difference between an 80 nanometer exosome and something along an apoptotic body is probably a little more around 7 to 800 nanometers. Uh, your microvesicles may fall in line with exosomes as they can be anywhere from the 200 to 500 nanometer range. Um, and as anyone who's ever done this or seen, 
there is a major overlapping as there's a heterogeneity to the populations themselves. Uh, obviously, the, I guess my, my also punch here is that preparation is number one. So if you're bringing samples that, that are basically just uh, ultra centrifuge or gradient and down to just a certain level, then it's going to be very difficult to separate exosomes from, say, those micro vesicles along with the lipoproteins, micelles. Um, but as you get up to the apoptotic bodies or oncosomes, this doesn't become a problem and you can separate them out uh, and get back very, very clear populations. Um, so I don't see that as a problem. We have done it before uh, with the larger sizes. It just be t depends on how the sample comes to you. All right, on to the next question is, how do you choose which trigger laser to use for size? Well, you, you usually want to use a laser that has um, a low, no, low noise, and uh, uh, <laughs> it's quite intuitive to think that uh, a 405 uh, nanometer wavelength would be the ideal. Uh, but the way the instrument is configured, especially uh, REQ, the 561 is the first one in line, so there's, um, it's the best one to uh, utilize for detection of the... Uh, Microvesicles. Now, saying that we may trigger with a 561, but then we utilize our 488 size scatter to look at the uh, at the signal. So it's uh, it's a balancing game. It's a technique that we have developed, uh, John and myself, uh, with the assistance of uh, Dr. Jones. And uh, depending of of the instrument that you have, you have to go over the specs and then make an educated decision which one is the best laser line to trigger with. All right, on to the next question. It asks, circulating endothelium-derived extracellular vesicle levels are thought to be altered in pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is PAH. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether there have been any research studies of EVs in systemic hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and whether you think flow cytometry could assist in elucidating EV biology in this area. That's a great question. <laughs> um, a you weren't kidding. Question. It's a very so, good question. As, as, as I like to say in most of my presentations on this, by no means am I a cardiologist, but I do not see, considering what we've been able to do as far as uh, the SVT, uh, you know, looking at cardiac resynchronization therapies, looking at ischemia re reperfusion, uh, along with uh, dealing with people with with heart issues and other factors in their exercise regimens and a multitude of other things on the microRNA front uh, that if we can identify the biomarkers that are relevant to this, we can obviously then look at them and see fluctuations in from normal or even, uh, you know, individuals that are, that are having hypertension. Uh, I, We've done this, uh, I believe Dr. Jones has done this in cholesterol models uh, to look at it. You can look down, as we also showed with the lipoproteins and the ApoB, you can get down to the LDL and the VLDL levels. So I would assume the same type of things would be uh, able to be looked at and prominent in, in many different modalities. Yeah, and should, and should be able to eventually translate to something clinical, too, as a diagnostic. It's... Um... You know, it's it's out there and can be done. Okay, on to the next question. Is it possible to separate EVs from lipoproteins in frozen plasma by ultracentrifugation? In theory, yes. Um, it is very difficult. I haven't seen it uh, a lot. It's one of the, the biggest problems, the contamination of the lipoproteins. Uh, even using the uh, lipophilic dyes, that's one of the big things is, is, look, is they will tag everything with a lipid membrane. So they're going to tag the exosomes, they're going to tag the lipoproteins, they're going to tag the micelles. Um, a lot of the problems, too, with the lipid dyes is they tend to formulate my cells and lipoproteins also. So they, even if you are completely pure, they tend to uh, actually cause the formation of them. Uh, the, like we said, any kind of antagonist causes these guys to release and, and start doing uh, unpredictable things. So 
when you get down to that level, it may be difficult to isolate them completely. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Uh, the next one, have you looked at EV distribution in the cell cycle and its relationship to cell cycle progression? Uh, we have not. I don't know, John, I don't know if you have any experience with that, but as, uh, I did some work recently, uh, but it wasn't with cell cycle looking, trying to look at uh, extracellular vesicles, but I, I haven't progressed much. I'm still in development of the protocol. Yeah, we really haven't done anything with cell cycle. I haven't seen anything actually in the literature on that also, um, and I may be wrong, but I, I really haven't gotten any kind of position on that. One of the last type calls I was on in regards to this type stuff was uh, even looking at how people don't in this type studies we don't even do live dead markers um, so we haven't really moved on to proliferation as we haven't even tried to quantify uh, are we actually looking at a high percentage of viable and happy uh, exosome populations Okay, I think we'll get one more question in here. It says, have you compared by your FCM analysis cell-derived EVs prepared by different methods, such as UC, ExaQuick, concentration filter, and others? Um, I'll give the short answer of yes. Yeah. Uh, we've looked at multiple methods, some that I'm unable to mention because they are uh, pro property of the particular institutions and individuals who develop them. Others are simply saying, yes, we've done the ExoQuick and, um, uh, you know, many different kits from through in vitro gen and uh, labeling type things, just doing centrifugation, doing, uh, as we said, kind of uh, gradient filtration. So people have looked at many different methodologies. Uh, all of them give Decent results, uh, none of them are perfect or, you know, the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so it really depends on, I guess, ease of use, right? At the end of the day, which is the easiest, most uh, time-efficient methodology uh, that gives, you know, good results. And we've been doing a lot of that, and I hope to be able to present some of that in the near future. All right. I'm afraid there's, there's still a whole bunch of great questions, but we are really uh, over time, so I'm going to wrap up the question and answer session. Uh, I'd like to tell you that today's webinar has been recorded, and it will be available for viewing in the next few days, and we'll send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar. So on behalf of today's speakers and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Wiley Publishers.